The Dental Brief is brought to you by Omni Premier Marketing and the amazing guests who bring wisdom and advice that you can put to use to take your business and practices to the next level. Find us on Facebook and join the conversation. Get ready to grow because we are kicking off the next episode in three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. Excited for today's guest. We're getting ready to kick off our our fall season. I think our first episode aired today. We'll have a whole bunch coming October, November, December. So we're excited for that. Let's get the introductions done and out of the way today. My guest is Perrin Desports. Did I say your last name correctly? Close enough. Yeah. It's French, but I'm not. De- Desports, Desports, however you want to say it, it's fine, Patrick. Awesome. Yeah. I'm French too. I definitely claim that I'm French depending on what's going on on the world stage, but um, <laughs> it seems to be a good time. But thank you so much for being here. You're with Blair's Health Partners. You're one of the, the founders, correct? Yeah, I'm co-founder of it. Yes, right. And we're going to jump into that in a little bit. I'm going to kind of give a little background. You help uh, dentists with all things CEO related, right? building, going from a clinician, going from a practice or someone who practices dentistry to someone who runs businesses, which I think is fantastic and great to have you here. So tell me real quickly, how'd you get involved in dentistry? How'd you get in this area? How'd you become an expert here? Uh, yeah, I mean, experts uh, used in quotations, right? So, you know, I, you could say I was sort of born into the industry. I'll, I'll give you the, the 20 second version, hopefully. I'm fourth generation of a family that owned a dental distribution business that was headquartered out of Columbia, South Carolina, where I was born and raised. Um, My great-grandfather, James Perrin Thompson, started the business in 1899 um, called Thompson Dental Company. My father was president and CEO when I was in the business in the mid-90s. My grandfather was chairman of the board, and we elected to sell that business to Patterson Dental Supply uh, in April of 2002 not for financial or operational reasons, but more due to poor equity transition planning reasons. And we can get into that in a little bit if you'd like to. I stayed on with Patterson, ran three different businesses for them over a 15-year career. I learned a tremendous amount about business from them, really an invaluable experience. I would have loved to have stayed working with my dad, but at the same time, I never would have had the opportunity to do what I did on a bigger stage if I if, if we hadn't made that decision. So left Patterson at the very end of 2016 to launch a venture called Tusk Partners with two other operating partners, left that business in March of 2021 to launch Polaris Healthcare Partners with my co-founder, DeWalker Sinha. And Polaris is a a strategic consulting and sell-side advisory firm that focuses exclusively with group practices, and the vast majority of those are group dental practices. So it's the growth and scale piece, like you mentioned, clinician to CEO, how do you attract and retain associates, how to use bank funds appropriately to to grow and scale the organization. And then when you reach some level of success and you want to take some chips off the table, we can help you transact the business as well. So it's a it's a nice, you know, kind of dual-sided firm, if you will, that has transaction revenue and retainer revenue. Yeah. So you know what I love about having you on the show today is, and I think I'm going to kind of steer this a little bit, I, I want by all means for you to talk about challenges that Dennis come to you with. Um, yeah. We have some guests that have been on the podcast. I meet plenty that you know, or like I'm going to DSO, it's an individual dentist, or maybe a couple of good friends that are both dentists and they get two locations, three locations, four locations, five locations. But that's kind of where that plateau seems to stop. I see from yep. most, like getting past that fifth location. It's terrible. And then they start to realize that, hey, they're not making any more money than when they have one location or two locations, but they have a lot more stress and a lot more headache. So you tell me, what are some challenges when you get a phone call? Who's the type of dentist that's calling you and what are the types of challenges that they're having? Yeah, we, Patrick, we could make a, a five-part weekly series on this question if you wanted to, but I'll I'll try to be comprehensive and brief. So the first thing is somebody, the only time somebody wants to add additional locations is when they have a successful first location. Nobody wants to scale failure, right? But when you are the the business owner, the primary economic engine, the CEO, head of HR and everything else, and it's all under one roof, literally four walls, you have a pretty good degree of control over everything. And if you can get patients to accept the treatment you propose and you can perform the clinical treatment required, you can generate a healthy amount of income. And then if you build that successfully and you want to add an additional location or maybe two is where things get a little dicey. The bank will probably loan you money to buy the second location, which is usually based off the validity of the first location. But if you don't understand valuation, 
and what to pay for a practice you're about to acquire. If you don't understand how to curtail some of the expense structure, trim some of the expense structure, and or generate additional revenues that the seller was not able to generate, you're not really making an economic impact in that business. And now it becomes a matter of cash flow. How much is the second location generating in terms of cash flow after you pay an associate to work there? And is it enough to offset the bank loan payments? And I would right. tell you all too often it's not, or if it is, it's at a razor thin marginal level. So how do we fix that problem? Well, we acquire a third, right? I mean, if the second one's not going very well, you double down on it and go for number three. And that right. that's yeah. what we typically see that somebody has you know, three or four locations generating three or four times the amount of revenue that the, the, the first practice did, but they're making about half as much in terms of take home income. What they don't think about is how to replace themselves in a clinical capacity to become a leader and how you get paid to do that, make an economic impact. But also this transition of a mindset from an income based mindset of a first practice into more of a wealth generating valuation based impact on multiple locations. Right. Bank funding is a primary challenge to that because banks understand the risk profile for one to two locations is basically zero. Dentists don't default on debt, but sure. they absolutely do when you get to four to five to six or more. And that's why banks are less likely to lend on locations three and four when they were perfectly happy doing it on one or two. And then right. you get into things like five to 10 locations. Are we going to centralize it, the back end infrastructure, create a call center, hire a professional management team and all that kind of stuff? But that's a different phase of growth. I would tell you the one to five location is the emerging group. It's the fastest moving segment in the space. And it's also the space with the most uh, level of danger to it. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about when to get started, right? So if you know that, and, and this, I, I get this, I've had guests on the show that said, you know, why'd you become, why'd you become a dentist? And their answer is, well, I wanted to own a business. I wanted to own businesses and it seemed like dentistry was a good business to own. So I learned how to become a dentist, which is fantastic. If you want to own an accounting firm, you probably should become an accountant first. It's probably not a bad idea, right? Not necessary, but not a bad idea. When, when should you get started? So you know you want to scale. You know that, hey, I want to be a CEO and I want to be a dentist. When, when do you get going on that? When's the time to engage a, a company that can help navigate that path? Yeah, so I'm not going to get on a soapbox here, but I think we're at a dangerous point in the industry because I end up talking to a lot of study groups and third and fourth year dental students, and a lot of them have this very same question. And you can make a compelling case, at least anecdotally, that there are a lot of people who are going to dental school who don't wanna be a practicing clinician. They wanna be a multi-location business owner because they see dollar signs in the future. Sure. And I don't know that that's a good thing for the profession. That's again, probably a different podcast to have. What I will tell you is that there are a couple of things to think about. And let's just assume that the, the candidate in question here has built a successful practice. And when I say successful, that's staff continuity, that's patient retention, that's case acceptance. And for the owner, that's cash flow. We as successful business owners tend to, our lifestyle tends to calibrate to our level of income. And what we see most often is that successful solo dentists are taking all the money out of the business to fund kids in private school, a nice house, a beach house, a couple of cars, whatever. Look, sure. none of us do what we do for free, and there's nothing wrong with that. However, if you are going to build a multi-location group, you have to create margin for error. And margin for error starts with cash on balance sheet and cash on the sidelines and creating some level of of a lower level of ex personal expenses on the home front than what the business will bear in terms of income. Right. And if you have the discipline and have the ability to do that, and the rule of thumb is two times your monthly, average monthly operating expenses. So if it's a business that generates a million dollars in revenue and has $600,000 in overhead, that's 50 grand a month in terms of expenses. You need 100 grand on the sidelines before you should really start to, to get conviction about adding a second location because you have some level of a fallback position and a personal level of margin for error. The, the quicker you can get there is probably the more point of stability that you can take to move from one to two locations. The second thing would be, if you are going to add additional locations, you need to be able to forecast 
how quickly you are going to drop days of clinic, your personal day, clinical days of collections, not go from four days practicing clinically to zero. It's probably a gradual transition to replace yourself with an associate, but you're going to pay that associate to do work that you're no longer doing. And there's another yeah. income hit that's going to happen. So a lot of this that we would work with clients on that are early, early stage are simple financial forecasting that relates to uh, things like cash flow. And then we get into the EBITDA based valuations and the wealth context of the business they want to create. And I don't want to hear about somebody going from one to 10 to 20. I would rather hear about somebody wanting to go from one to maybe four over the next five years and do it methodically. Right. So basically, I mean, the pr principle of delayed gratification is what creates wealth for most people on this planet, right? It's delaying right. gratification, putting money away, investing money, whether it be in somebody else's business via the stock market or your own business by making continued capital contributions, right? It's a big yep. way to do it. One thing that I see that I think and you, you talked about some things that are changing in the industry and some um, dangers that are some kind of warning signs that might be coming up. One thing that I see right now happening is and when it comes to valuations and purely anecdotal, right? It's just what I hear. So take it for what it's worth. It's not going to be the information that you have exactly, but I see a lot of practices that the valuations seem to be built based more on the demand of the market, meaning there's a lot of buyers and there's not a lot of sellers. They're not so much based on numbers because you can see a practice with better numbers, right? Higher profitability, lower expenses, two awesome things to look at, right? In another market and the practice at a, a at half the price of, let's say a, a market like Denver where I'm at, it's half the price. So that has to show you it's more demand based, right? Than it is numbers based. Do you think that's true? I could answer every question with it depends, but sure. I think what you're what you're pointing at is is a really pertinent observation around the context of when we talk valuation, there's group practice buyer and the way they look at valuation of a business, typically normalized cash flow or EBITDA based valuation versus a doctor to doctor transaction, a bank funded uh, young associate buying out maybe gradually over time, a senior dentist and, and his or her transition out of the profession. So when we think about that, what you're pointing at in terms of a group practice buyer, and, and this is relevant to what, what I was talking about earlier on the going from one to two to three context, is that a lot of group buyers have a box, okay? They have an acquisition box. They have characteristics they're looking for, and they have a hard stop against things they won't acquire. And what we typically see is geographic coverage, and that could be what you're talking about. Maybe this practice that cash flows better is just in an area that they don't have operations or the ability to support if they did acquire it. It's 100 miles from the closest other practice and they can't support it. That could be right. one thing. It could be the payer mix. Uh, oftentimes, group buyers either won't acquire a practice that has any Medicaid exposure or it has to have very, very minimal Medicaid exposure. And in a rural context, that's typically typically more difficult to justify. Could be the seller staying on board. They only want to buy a practice when the seller is exiting and they want to replace them with an associate. Or maybe on the other hand, they only want to buy a practice where the seller is willing to stay for two to three years. Mm -hmm. You know, so and there are other things like number of operatories, et cetera, et cetera, that are considerations for, for group practice buyers. A lot of what I just rattled off isn't nearly as impactful to a doctor to doctor transaction because it's more of a cash flow income generation type of an acquisition. Sure. Sure. That, you know, let me ask you this too about delayed gratification. I, I know you see this. Uh, I'm assuming that you see this. A lot of dentists think that their practice is their retirement, right? It's their nest egg. I'm going to sell it for this amount of money. And usually that number is far less than what's in their head than what reality is. I see that happen often. I've heard I've seen practices where they think it's worth $3 million and the reality is it's worth a million. Big, big difference when you're talking about being 60 years old and retiring and counting on that money. But then when you do sell a practice, there's a lot of expenses, right? I mean, that's not cheap. You have taxes, you have brokerage fees, you have legal, you have, uh, legal fees, accounting fees, so on and so forth. And you might be, you might walk away with 50 or 60% of the amount that practice actually sells for, correct? 
That, that's right. And the other scary part is if you're still carrying any amount of d substantial debt on the business, that has to be solved for at the point of the transaction and change right. of ownership. So, yeah, we run those types of analyses for a lot of our emerging groups that might look to exit. And what you find is that in a, in a five location group, say, and you're going to sell it to a an industry strategic or something and the, the transaction, you know, could be $10 million, but 60% of that could be in cash and 40% could be in an equity rollover. So 60% in cash, just like you said, you have advisor fees, legal and accounting. There's some amount of long-term cap gains or depreciation recapture. And then you got to pay off the, the looming bank note. And it could very well be that on a $10 million transaction, you put less than a million dollars cash in the bank in a scenario like that. So these are things yeah. that, you know, if you are counting on your business, be it a solo practice or a group to fund your retirement, this is not something you should think about a month before you go to market. This should be a context of three to five years out and, and preparing the business and yourself for sale. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to talk about your website real quick. Ton of information on there. Great blog. You have classes on the website, just a, a wealth of information there. Who's the ideal, right? So who's who's the ideal dentist? Who's the ideal practice owner that it's worth their time or it makes sense for them to reach out with you? Who are the types of candidates that you work with and, and that would value the most by visiting your site? Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. So I think they're, we kind of put them in three buckets. And the first is simply somebody who has a successful practice and they, like everybody else in the industry, is wondering, should I build a group practice? Now, that's the world that we operate in, but it doesn't mean that I think everybody should do it. OK, so the first is, should I or should I not do it? I, I might have one successful practice for those who started the journey and they're, let's just say, two to five locations, an emerging group. They have challenges around attracting and retaining associates, using debt funds appropriately, executing your buy or build strategy or a blend of both. And really that's about that transition from full-time clinician into a leadership role and how you how you build a business that's that's bigger than yourself. So I think the two to five segment is a really, and those are loose terms, you know, two to five locations, but that's a really popular group for us and we make a lot of impact with them. And there's a lot of information on our website that's educational about that. If you're five or more, now you, you've got a choice on your hands, meaning you've got proof of concept. How big do you want to grow it? And some people like five and they stop at five. It's a lifestyle business. Cash flows wonderfully. Hey, more power to you. Others want to build a strong regional group that might be 20 to 50 locations. So they're going to centralize administrative infrastructure. They're going to bring on a professional management team. They're going to build a call center. It's going to be, be a regulatory compliant legal DSO structure. All that kind of investment in the business to create the inflection point that's the next phase of growth and scale. And right. we do two conferences a year, one in the fall uh, coming up in October in Scottsdale that's called Scaling from Clinician to CEO. That's at that one to five location. We do another conference in the spring this past year. It was in Fort Lauderdale called Building Your Enterprise Platform. One is the one to five group and the other is the five to 50 group. So there's a lot of information uh, depending on sort of where you are in your journey. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a tricky question. I love to ask this of our guest. I'm going to point out the website just in case I forget at the end. It's polarishealthcarepartners.com. So I want to yeah. encourage our audience to check that out. But here's the question for you. So there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of individuals that you can't find much information about. There's smaller groups. There's bigger groups that are all professionals and, and I put professionals in quotes. I'm knocking any individual whatsoever and helping dentists navigate these waters, right? Whether it's, hey, we'll help you sell your practice or we help you sell the DSOs or you know what I'm talking about. Everyone listening knows what I'm talking about. So how do you vet someone? So how do you find the right people, the right uh, company to work with? What are some questions that you should ask and what's some homework that you should do before uh, deciding to work with a, a person or a group? Yeah. So it, it, great, great question. And I'm going to break it. I'm going to break my answer down into the two different kind of segments of our business. One is the consulting for growth purposes and the other is like the transactional side of the business. What you find is that in, in the world of dentistry, there are 
I don't know how many hundreds of dental practice management consultants that are out there, and there are a number of them that are very good. Um, but they work at an operational level. They work on scheduling, scheduling retention and or hygiene retention and scheduling efficiency and case acceptance and all that at a clinic level, right? We don't do any of that. If you have trouble with case presentation, I am not your guy, all right? But if you want to build a multi-location group, that's business strategy. That's not clinical fundamentals. So I would say just understand the difference in, in what is what you might consider a, a traditional dental practice management consultant versus a group practice strategist, which is what we do. So we, we know our niche and we know what we're not in that context. And obviously, if somebody's thinking about building a group, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I said earlier. We see a lot of messes. This sure. is not a journey for the faint of heart. And just because everybody else is doing it does not mean you should do it, too. So if a consultant is talking you into it, that might be a red flag. My job is to talk you out of it. And if you really want to do it, then then we can talk about how to work together. So that I, and of course, you can talk to current or former clients, refer references from the, the firm you're evaluating on the sell side advisory piece. Much like in dental practice management consultants, there are a lot of traditional dental practice brokers that do doctor to doctor transactions. And those transactions are not very complicated because if the bank will fund it, it's probably going to go. On the right. other hand, if you own a group practice and you're looking to exit it, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a transaction that was 100 percent cash. It always has some level of a rollover equity component. And that right. is where the transaction gets infinitely more complicated. So what are we doing with distributions? How do we how do we price the shares? Is it peri pursue? How can you if you want to leave early, how do you get your equity out before a recap? Is there preferred versus common stock? Are there put and call rights? There's a whole lot of stuff in there. Perrin, thank you so much for being on the show today. We appreciate your time, your expertise. It means a lot. We always appreciate it when people share and help our, our audience and listeners grow, achieve their goals. I want to encourage the audience one more time to check out the website. It's polarishealthcarepartners.com. Perrin, thank you so much for being here. Patrick, thanks for having me on today. I've really enjoyed it. Hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime soon.